how's everybody feeling? Man, I'm so glad you guys are here. Do me a favor. Will you look at see, somebody seated next to you just say, hey. Come on now. Say it like you mean it. Be like, hey. Real talk. I'm glad you're here. Now, now, now look to the other side, the person you didn't say it to. Be like, no, nah, for real though, I'm glad you're here too. I'm glad you're here too. Well, today we are continuing a series that we began last week. It is called Built Different. On the count of three, everybody say Built Different. You guys ready? One, two, three. Built Different. Um, one of our main takeaways from last week was this. The path of Jesus is not a nicer way for us to live however we want. It's an end to one way of life and the beginning of a new one. This is what it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17. This is one of our key scriptures last week, and we're going to build upon this today. It says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. That's why oftentimes when, when somebody has experienced salvation, meaning they have given their life to Christ, oftentimes you will hear uh, somebody say, I was born again, uh, meaning death to my old self, I'm being raised in Christ. Because the gospel is not about behavior modification. The gospel is about life transformation. Yes, you will see your behaviors change, but that's because the Holy Spirit is cleansing you from the inside out. Today we're going to build upon that, and my prayer is that if you are already a Christ follower, that today you would leave this room with a deeper and greater understanding that you are being called by God for such a time as this. Let me say it again. My prayer is that as we exit today, if you are already a believer, that you would have a deeper understanding, a greater fire within you in understanding that you are called by God for such a time as this. I don't believe that you were accidentally born into this generation. I believe that God has a plan and purpose for your life for this generation. And my prayer for you today, if you're not already a believer, meaning you've never bowed the knee to Christ, you've never surrendered your life to him, my prayer for you is that you would consider Jesus. My prayer for you would be that you would have your eyes opened to the gospel and the love and forgiveness of Jesus. Not what you've heard your whole life from another preacher, but that Jesus would show up and you would have a real encounter with him. Today, we're going to be looking at a lot of uh, scripture from the book of Luke. Um, somebody just said, woo, okay. Somebody was like, I love that, you know, because somebody was like, I, I read that this week, you know. Somebody probably just got real excited. They're like, I did my homework, you know. Um, today, we're looking at the book of Luke. It was written by a man named, okay, yeah, no trick questions today. I'm not going to be like, gotcha, you know. So it was written by this man, Luke. Let me give you a little context before we begin reading any scripture. Uh, Luke was a physician. Uh, shout out to anybody that's a physician in the room. And um, he knew, and, and we see at the beginning of the book of Luke, he knew that there were going to be others that the Holy Spirit used to, to write other gospels. So he makes it very clear at the beginning, hey, I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm also giving an account for the life of Jesus. And that's what he does. He begins to share the life of Jesus and and starts to share some of the miracles that Jesus performed. And by the time we get to Luke chapter 6, Jesus is already like trending in the area. Everyone at this point has heard about Jesus. They're like, you guys heard of Jesus of Nazareth? He's, he's healing people. He's, he's opening up blind eyes. He's doing all of these amazing things. And, and so people were already following the ministry of Jesus in Luke chapter 6. We're going to begin reading in verses 12 through 13. It says, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray. Let me pause right there. I promise I'm, I'm not going to be doing that the whole time, stopping at every scripture. But if Jesus stopped to pray to his heavenly father, 
I'm talking about Jesus, who's also God. If he stopped to pray to his heavenly father, how much more so should you and I be in constant communication with our heavenly father? It says, and and Jesus spent the night praying to God. Maybe some of you are in a season like that where you can't even sleep. You're just communicating with God throughout the night in prayer. It says, "When, when morning came, Jesus called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them whom he also designated apostles. Some of y'all are like, wait, hold up. I'm not tracking with you. Because it says that he chose 12 of them, but there were already 12 of them. Back up a little bit. You're referring to the 12 disciples, the apostles, you know, that we're all familiar with, right? You're talking about, um, you know, Matthew and and you got Bartholomew and all of these people. And, and then you actually have two Judases, but one of them goes by Thaddeus. You know, his actual name was Judas, but Judas, but I just can imagine him like, hey, I know something's happened. There's something suspicious about this guy. Well, I'm going to go by a different name so I don't get confused with that guy, you know. And so, so you're thinking of those 12 disciples, which those are Jesus' disciples. But he also had a whole group of other disciples who were actively following Jesus where he went. So Jesus looks at this big group of disciples, which, side note, if you are a Christ follower, you are a disciple of Jesus. You guys tracking with me? So he looks at this group and he says, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. You guys are going to be apostles. I could just imagine, like, the guy standing next to him, the 13th guy's like, wait, but, uh... You're done counting? See, some of y'all don't have much, like, um, background with not being the one picked. But let me tell you something. I grew up playing basketball my whole life. Had the opportunity to play a couple of years of college basketball. And I have been in many of gyms where they will shoot for team captains. And and one guy's like, yeah, I'm number one cap, number two captain. Everyone stands on the baseline. And I'll be like. Let's be real for a moment. Look at me. (laughs) I got on some slacks and some penny loafers. I don't look like I can hoop. So I will always get picked last. I just know it's going to happen. So so I'm used to this, right? But but these people are standing there, and for a moment, like, put yourself in, in, in their jandals, their Jesus sandals, and imagine you had been following Jesus, and you don't get picked. I want to ask you a question. What do you do in life when it seems like you've been overlooked? When it seems like everyone else is getting a promotion but you? Oftentimes what I see is many people get stinking thinking. And, and then and then we'll be like, oh man, I didn't, I didn't want that job anyways. And we get these bad attitudes or, or what we do is we will just quit. We'll just throw in the towel, and we'll be like, you know what? It just must not have been meant to be. Or, or uh, people say, well, man, it ain't really even worth it anyways. But I'm so glad that there were some people, some disciples, that continued to follow Jesus anyways, who didn't get stinking thinking, but they remained faithful and held on because Chapter 6 was not the only time that Jesus made some selections. Again, in chapter 10, Jesus begins to start choosing some people, and he chooses them to be the disciples to go out and to be the hands and feet of Jesus. That's a big honor. And the problem is, is that most of us allow our pride to keep us from what God is calling us to. We didn't get picked in one season, so we quit before the next season that God had for us. But if you quit before chapter 10 in your life, you will always miss out on what God is trying to do in and through your life. How do I know that? Well, this is what it says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. It says, and I am certain that God who began the good work within you, pause, please be reminded, you did not start that good work within yourself. That is from God, therefore he is in control. 
He will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So many of us, we bail right before the breakthrough. We look around and, and, and we compare ourselves to others. Well, they look like they're further along. Or, you know, I was working harder at this or that. And we bail right before God was about to move us into the next season. So we get mad at God because we feel stuck. But in all actuality, you just keep quitting. I wonder what would happen if we had a little more holy grit and we were like, you know what, God, I trust you. I trust that you're in control. I'm going to continue to keep going in the direction that you have for my life. It goes on in Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. And it says, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him. He's speaking to the very people that just four chapters earlier were not selected, but they continued to faithfully serve Jesus. It says, after the Lord appointed 72 others and he sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lamb, lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse. Some of the ladies are like, I'm already out. <laughs> Jesus, come on, I can't take a purse. Don't take a purse or bag or sandals. And, and do not greet anyone on the road. Some, some of the people from our greeting team, y'all would have had a problem with that. You know, out front, we got our greeting team as you want. They'd have been like, Jesus, I can't. Say. You know, it's like we're like walking down the path, and all two's like, hey, how you doing? It's like, all two, stop, man. Jesus was very clear. He, he said, don't greet anyone. He's got a reason. Um, how many of you know, man, moving is tough? You, anybody move recently? You can like barely lift your arm. You're like, it was tough, you know? Like, you, you never really know what you have until you move. You're like, this could be a piece of cake. I remember, so. This is, how, this is how dumb I can be. Uh, so we had all of our family in Texas when we moved uh, here to Michigan in October of 2019, and they all helped us load up. I'm talking about brothers and, and, and every uncles. Everybody's helping us load up, and it was done like that, right? And we get about halfway from Fort Worth to Detroit, and my wife looks over at me. She goes, uh, so we're moving into the second floor of an apartment. Who's going to help us move this stuff in? I didn't think of that. I'm not going to let her know that, though. I'm like, oh, are you kidding me? This is going to be a breeze, you know? This is easy. What are you talking about? I got this, right? I'm like, oh, gosh, what are we doing? So we pull up. I open up the trailer, and I'm like, bro, we got sofas. How am I, how am I going to get a sofa to the second floor? I remember after that, when we ended up moving about a year later into a different apartment, there was a guy in our church, he was playing uh, college football over at Wayne State, and I said, I, I learned my lesson, I ain't doing it alone this time. So I was like, hey, bro, can you and a few of your teammates come and help me move? I remember, I, it, was, it was crazy. We, we, I packed everything up, I was like, yeah, that needs to go to the trailer. I turn around, I'm like, everything's gone. It was like that. What I'm saying is, we need some more workers here in Detroit. Because the, the, the harvest is ripe. There are people in our sphere of influence who are just one conversation away from encountering Christ. That is not something that we can take loosely. That's not something as a believer where we could just point at somebody else and say, okay, get out there, you go do that. No, what about me? What about the conversations in the sphere of influence that God has called for me to have? And Jesus in this passage, he's, he's telling them, Hey, this is not about your personal comfort or convenience. It is about the kingdom of God. Now, before I say this next statement, by the look on your face as I say this, I will be able to very clearly see your level of spiritual maturity. Yeah, yeah, when I say this, like the way that you respond to this statement it shows me how spiritually mature you are. You ready? So what I need you to understand is that your life is not just about you. Okay, we go. 
that's so spiritually mature. Some of y'all's face like, it's not. But my whole life is, all I've ever heard is, hey, you do you, boo. It's just whatever you feel like doing. Oh, here in America, we think this whole world revolves around ourselves. But those who are spiritually mature, they know that it's not just about me, but it's about building the kingdom of God here on earth. It's not just about the, the things that I can accumulate to create convenience in my life. It's about being a blessing to other people. You and I, we are the hands and feet of Jesus in this generation. That should wake us up. That should wake us up. We will admit, yes, you. If you are a Christ follower, you are a disciple of Christ. The next generations are dependent upon your faithfulness and obedience to share the gospel. There are people who, who need to encounter Christ, and it is dependent upon your faithfulness in sharing the good news. Let me say this. As your pastor, you are the ones that God has called to step into the spaces and places of influence that God has given you. I'll break it down. I'm not the one raising your family. You are. I'm not the one uh, that is going to parent your children. You are. I'm not the one that's going to step into the classroom. You are. I'm not the one going to your job on Monday. You are. And so often, I think, especially in America, we all point the, the, the finger to the pastor and say, get out there, lead everybody to the Lord. But we're all the workers in this field. The harvest is ripe. So, so you got to understand, as your pastor, it's not my job to do everything. It's my job to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. So if, if you constantly feel like walking away and you're like, man, I just feel good about every sermon. I don't ever feel challenged. I'm missing it. Because I'm supposed to challenge you to do the work of the ministry. That's why we say at Motor City Church all the time, you and I, we are called to be the church in the world. At, at Motor City Church, we don't just go to church. We are the church. I don't know why I just thought somebody would clap for that right there. <laughs> okay. Y'all are looking at me like, okay, pastor, I'm feeling this one today. This is convicting. We don't just go. Church is not a Sunday morning activity. It is who we are. Church is not Sunday from 11 to noon or 11.15, depending on how long I preach. Sometimes I go a little long. Sometimes, what? Some of y'all like, it's 11, it's 12.30, you know. <laughs> Chill, man. I get excited about preaching God's word. Church is 24-7, 365. Everywhere we go, we are the church. Luke chapter 10, verses 5 through 12. It says, when you enter, this is Jesus speaking. Oh, we got some people leaning in now. Who cares what I have to say? I'm just a man. We want to know what does our Savior have to say. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who, y'all are silly, man. Y'all calm down. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there eating and drinking whatever they give you. For the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of, of this, the kingdom of God has come near, I tell you. It will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. That is scary. Some of you don't know your Bible. Go read what happened in the Old Testament of Sodom and Gomorrah. This is Jesus' words. Jesus was telling them, he's sending these disciples ahead of him, and he's telling them what to do and how to do it. He's telling them that if 
if they want to represent him, there's a certain way that you're going to do it. He's giving them vision for that. Uh, This week, I read something on Facebook from somebody that I know. And do you ever just cringe at stuff you read on Facebook? Pastor Eric said always. Pastor Eric logs into social media, all of the accounts combined, for like four minutes annually. (laughs) This man despises social media. (laughs) But but I read something on Facebook this week. Uh, This person that I know, and this lady starts by saying something along the lines of, If you don't like how I follow Jesus, that's your problem. I'm like, that ain't Christ-like. And then I started to think about it. Hold up. Wait a minute. There is only one way to follow Christ. And that is the way that he tells you to. Where did we get off thinking that there are different updates and versions to the way that we follow Christ? Oh, I do the 2023 version of Jesus. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. His word is his word. He does not change. You do. He does not. And in a world that is constantly changing, that should comfort your soul. That you don't have to guess, well, what what mood is, is Jesus in today? He's the same. His word is his word. His promise is his promise and and he says if you want to follow me this is how you do it you're obedient to my word you don't just get to go represent me however you want you're going to do it in a certain manner uh any any any, uh basketball fans here okay we got some some of y'all like man the Detroit Pistons we haven't been doing too well like we're coming back baby we're coming back it's gonna be good we got any we got any fans basketball fans yeah okay Man, I don't know what's going on today. You guys are just like, um, anybody watch the, uh, the NBA championship recently? Okay, and uh, what, what was the guy that won MVP? Yes, I cannot pronounce his name. Yeah, what he said. And, uh, and I, I watched a post-game interview with him. This guy treats the NBA like it's a nine-to-five job. Like, he treats it like it's just like, oh, no big deal. Yeah, I, I get up in the morning, I go play basketball, whatever, right? And, and so at, they just win the championship. They give him the biggest award you can get in the NBA, which is MVP of the finals, all of this. And they're like, are you excited about the parade this coming week? I promise you, he turns to the people, he goes, I have to go to a parade? <laughs> I could just see, like, the publicist in the side. They're like, yes, be excited about it, you know? And then he ended up having a great time. He had no clue about this parade, right? But, but all of us, we know that when someone is a champion, we don't hide it. It's not like, we won the championship. Don't let anybody know. No, they do a whole parade. I mean, it's been a while since we've had one in Detroit, but we're going to get one soon. But, but you parade it around. You're like, we won the championship. And I need to wake up and remind a believer in this room today, you are a champion, not because of what you've done, but because of who you serve. You serve the victor. The Bible is very clear that Jesus has already defeated death, hell, and the grave. And every single day, we have the opportunity, opportunity to introduce people into a relationship with someone that can not just, you know, fix them up a little bit like HGTV, but rather they can take them from death and bring them into life. I'm talking about somebody who is going to spend eternity in hell, separate from their maker, can experience salvation and be made new again. That is something that we celebrate. That is something that we, we're not quiet about. I was just talking to somebody in the lobby. They went to the Ed Sheeran concert last night. Okay, somebody, somebody's like, Ed Sheeran, you know. Somebody's excited. And, and then um, they were telling me that as a special guest, as a special guest, uh, they brought out Eminem. Maybe you've heard of him. I don't know, right? <laughs> maybe, you, maybe you heard of him. But, uh, but then I started to think about, because he was telling me how the place went crazy when they announced Eminem. Let me tell you something, Eminem has never saved anyone. I know someone who has literally brought millions of people from eternal death into life. And it saddens me that in America, we could talk about the good news of the gospel and get golf claps. But we will fill an entire arena, bring out a man 
and, and everyone will go, yeah, it's him and him. What about your Savior? And we got too many people that are hiding Christianity. I had a conversation with somebody this week, and we were talking about how this celebrity, we were like, I, I, we were talking about, I wonder if they're a believer. I said, probably not. If we don't know they're a believer, it's probably not a believer. We'll know them by their fruit. And only God knows, ultimately. I don't know about that individual. But, but let me tell you something. If I were to go around and ask your coworkers or the people that uh, uh, you go to class with or whatever it's sphere of influence, the gym, whatever the case may be, would there be enough evidence uh, for me to convict you as a Christian? Some of you, I might be like, hey, do you know her? Oh, yeah, we know her really good. Is she a Christian? I don't know. That's scary. Because the, 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 the fields, the harvest is ripe. What are we doing with the gospel? Now, that doesn't mean that we go out and we're arrogant and we're prideful. Like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a believer. Yeah, what do you got? Uh, yeah, if you don't like the way I follow Jesus, that's your problem. That's arrogant. That's ignorant. That's not Christ-like. I like to say it this way. As a believer... Keep your humility. Shed your insecurity because Jesus gave you your identity. Let me say it again. Keep your humility, believer, but shed your insecurity because Jesus gave you your identity. Man, I want to be a church that is so faith-filled that we don't put limits on God because there are no limits on God. But oftentimes we have small thinking. We have small faith. It's a constant reminder for Emily and I because my wife and I, we met when we were in third grade. And she wasn't, yeah, somebody was like, okay, yeah. There's a movie coming out about us soon. It's a love story. It's going to be great. But no, no, so we met in third grade. We weren't just like acquaintances. Like we, we, it wasn't like we just knew of each other. Like my wife and I have been great friends since we were in third grade. She knows everything about me, right? And, and you can ask her when you see her in the lobby or wherever. She will tell you, because y'all think I'm kidding when I say this. I am an introvert. I am terrified to stand in front of you in this very moment. But let me tell you something. When you give your life to Christ and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, he will use you to do things that you could never do on your own. And some of the times we limit what God can do because of things that people have spoken over us. Oh, well, you're just, you, you know, you're just an introvert. Yeah, but I'm also a child of God. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. He could do with me what he wants to do with me when I submit to him. Luke uh, 10, 17, it says, The 72 um, returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. So they go out. They begin to say, hey, Jesus is coming to your town. And, and they come back and they report to Jesus. They're like, Jesus, this is crazy. Like even the demons submit to your name. And, and, but it says that they come back after doing all of this ministry, and they come back filled with joy. And nowadays, you hear a lot about pastors experiencing burnout and feeling depleted. And oftentimes, it's because people are pouring out what they haven't poured into themselves. Daily, it is your responsibility to fill yourself back up. I'm going to read God's word to you today, but what about Monday morning at breakfast? I won't be there. So get in God's word. Fill yourself up because I'm telling you, as you're out in the fields that are ripe for a harvest, you're going to have opportunities to pour out, to share something, but it has to come out of a place where you've been filled up. You cannot continue to pour out in something that you haven't filled. Many of you are trying to pour out and you're feeling depleted and you're feeling burned out because you never fill yourself back up. They came back with joy, which leads me to believe that there's a right way to do ministry and there's also a wrong way to do ministry. And at Motor City Church, we want to do ministry the right way. And I hope you understand when I say ministry, I'm not just talking about the ministry staff. I'm talking about you and I. Some of y'all are like, oh, I don't know, because the church where I used to go to, the pastor did everything. Did you grow? 
I've met people who have been a part of Motor City Church for a year now who have grown more in their faith in one year than they've grown in the past 25 years. Get in the word for yourself. Don't just rely on one other person to tell you about who Jesus is. Discover him for yourself. And so at Motor City Church, man, we want to do ministry the right way collectively, all of us. And at Motor City Church, hear me now, there's no extra points for burnout. Man, how many times do you come across a Christian like, man, hey, brother, how you doing? Oh, man, I'm just tired, you know. I, I've been doing a lot for people, and it's like, it says they came back filled with joy. Filled with joy. You do not, here at Motor City Church, we do not wear burnout like a badge of honor. He's the most tired. He must be doing the most. Well, he might not be filling himself up daily. He might not be getting in God's word. He might not be having quiet time with, with, with his heavenly father. We believe that here at Motor City Church that we can be a church that even as we regularly serve and pour ourselves out, that we can be filled with joy because Jesus is filling us up daily as we feed on his word and as we exalt and worship him. Now, I need you to notice one final thing. What did Jesus say? Remember where all the ladies like checked out? They were like, I can't bring a purse. I'm out, right? Jesus says, don't bring anything with you. Don't bring this. Don't bring that. Don't bring this. So, so they left empty-handed, but they came back with full hearts. And as I was thinking about this this week, I thought, I wonder if oftentimes our hearts aren't full because our hands are full. And here in America, many of us will blame ministry, but maybe it's not ministry. Maybe it's that you are carrying things that you should not be carrying in a way that you are not supposed to be carrying them. Okay, Jesus, you want me to go do ministry for you? You want me to be uh, the hands and feet for you in this generation? Okay. Jesus said, I didn't tell you to bring that secret sin with you. Lay that at the cross. Yeah, but Jesus, I've been, I've been doing this for a long time, Jesus. Lay it at the feet of the, at the cross. We don't follow Jesus how we want to follow Jesus. We follow Jesus the way he's told us to follow him. And that is fully submitted to him. So what are you carrying right now that's keeping you from really living out the calling that God has put on your life? Who have you shared Christ with recently? Oh, man, I, that's not for me. That is for you, believer. No, you don't understand. I'm not good with talking. You have a story. Share it with others. And oftentimes, the reason why we can't pour out is because we're holding on to things that we don't need to be holding on to. Pride. We can't build his kingdom because secretly we're, we're really building a kingdom for myself. I'm trying to make my name known. God won't use you that way. It's not until you fully surrender and say, God, use me how you see fit. Luke 10, 18 through 20, I love this. This is a final scripture. It says, Jesus replied, he was talking about the, what these guys were quoted saying. He says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, you guys remember when they were like, Jesus, Jesus, even the demons submit to your name. Jesus is kind of correcting them a little bit because they're focused on the wrong thing. And, 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 and that's what happens to many of us is that we will major on the minor. We, we've got to be focused on God's word so that way we can major on the major. Jesus says, however, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. He's saying, guys, you guys are getting so excited that these demons submit to my name. You're forgetting that because of what I've done, you now can be in heaven with me forever. You've gone from death to life. That's something that you and I can celebrate today. Whether you've been walking with Christ for a long time, you've been saved and set free. What are you doing with the gospel? And maybe for you, you're saying, man, I've never received Christ into my life. Isn't it amazing that God loves you so much, he's given you another opportunity. 
I don't know how many more of these you have. Tomorrow's not promised. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. Oh, yeah, Pastor, man, this is good, man. You know, I, I've really decided that, you know, in my life, I'm going to do the Christian life, but I'm going to do that like when I'm, I'm in my 30s, maybe 40s. Let me just, let me go wild out for a little bit. Let me do my own thing. Let me just hold on to th this over here for a while. No, fully submit now. God's trying to use you now. There are people that are in your sphere of influence that need to know Christ now. What are we doing with the gospel? This is not and will not ever be a church where we come to play church games. If this was about growing a church attendance, I promise you I would not preach the way that I preach. I wouldn't. If I, man, I'm telling you, I could, I could preach in a way where every week you leave and you're like, dude, I'm the man. Dude, I'm killing it in life. I could make you feel that way. But then guess what? One day when my knee is bowed before Christ, when I move from this life to the, the next, I'm going to have to give an account for everything that I preached and everything I didn't preach. So at this church, we preach the fullness of God's word. Not just the things that are comfortable. Not just, not just the things that we all like. The Bible is not a buffet. We don't look at the Bible and go, blessing, yeah, I'll take a scoop of that. Uh, yep, marriage, I'll take a scoop of that. Sacrifice, now I'm going to skip that. No, no, no. We believe all of it. We believe all of it. Today, if you've never given your life to Christ, I want to give you the opportunity right now. I want to be very clear about this. I'm asking you if you've been born again, you've given your life to Christ. I'm not asking you if you claim to be a Christian, that if you filled out, you, you know, a questionnaire, you'd select the box that says Christian. I'm not asking that. I'm not asking you if you have um, a Bible verse in your Instagram bio. I'm not asking you that if in your jewelry box you have a cross necklace. Those things are great, but they will not get you into heaven. I'm asking you, have you fully surrendered your life, given your life to Christ. May Jesus, your Savior and Lord. I want to ask everybody to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. If that's you, you've never received Christ, I want to give you the opportunity right now. And maybe you still have questions. Maybe you still have doubt. The Bible says that if you have the faith just the size of a mustard seed, tiny, you place it in Christ that you could be saved. You will be saved. So maybe you have questions and doubt. I'm asking you that, that, that little faith that you have, put it in Jesus today. You can pray this prayer. Just say, God, forgive me of my sins. God, I've tried this whole life my own way. And I'm unfulfilled. But God, today, I decide to give my life to you. I surrender my life to you. I give all of me to you. God, would you make me new? God, I receive your grace, your mercy, and your forgiveness. Through all of my questions and doubts, God, the, I place my faith in you. To the best of my ability, I believe. Heavenly Father, you sent your son Jesus to this earth to live a perfect and holy life, to live the life that I could have never lived. And I believe that he died on the cross for the punishment of my sins. And that he was buried, but three days later, he rose again, conquering and defeating death. God, I place my faith in you. God, would you make me new? As we say in a moment of prayer, if, 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 that, if that's you and you're saying, man, I'm giving my life to Jesus today for the very first time. On the count of three, would you just lift your hand? One, two, three. Amazing. Amazing. I see you. God, thank you for those that have just experienced salvation. God, we could not do it on our own. We cannot work our way into salvation. It's a, a free gift that we can only receive. God, we thank you for salvation. God, I pray that this week, for those that are believers in this room, God, as we wake up in the morning, that that would be on the forefront of our minds is how thankful and grateful we are for the gift of salvation. May we not live like it's common. 
God, I pray that this week, God, that you would use the Holy Spirit for the believers in this room, God, this week to have opportunities where they could share their faith with others. God, where they could have opportunities to pray with someone. God, where they'd have opportunities to bless someone. And God, share the good news. God, I pray that we would have the boldness, but that we would walk in humility. That everywhere we go, God, that we would be a light for you. God, we love you. We praise you. And everybody said, amen, amen.